Today is a beautiful day of celebration, a day to honor the women who've shaped us, nurtured us, and walked us through life. It's a day to say thanks to all the moms. Moms with toddlers tearing through the house, and moms whose babies have moved away. Moms who are doing this all by themselves, and moms who loved a child in need. Moms who have suffered unimaginable loss, and moms whose children are moms themselves. For all the times your love made things better, and the moments your wisdom made things clear, for the way you lived is an example, so we could see Jesus through you. For each and every memory that has lit the path we walk, we say thank you. Whether this is a day of celebration, reflection, or heartache, know that you are loved. Happy Mother's Day. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. I think it's a very special day. Let's all say it together. It's Mark Zuckerberg's birthday. The founder of Facebook and Instagram. Yes. We are so thankful because without Facebook, where would we put all the Mother's Day pictures? Right? Where would they go? Just kidding. <laughs> MySpace. Thank you so much for being here. Happy Mother's Day. Let's stand and sing together. You may have a seat. Good morning, family, church. Um, if you are visiting, thank you for coming today. Yeah, on the bottom of the, uh, the bulletin is a small card you can tear off, stick it in the offering plate, or you can give it to Jamie on your way out. We'd love to get in contact with you, connect with you, get to know you. So thank you for uh, coming today. Um, we, you can also check in the bulletin. There's several um, events coming up. I'm not going to list them all. But y'all can look in there. Um, it's going to be a busy summer. It's exciting. <clears throat> I have a, a question for you. Why are computers so smart? Why are computers so smart? Because they listen to their motherboards. <laughs> so happy Mother's Day. Today's a great day. It's Mother's Day. Um, and so we want to honor our mothers. If you're a mom today, if you'll please stand. We want to honor you. If you're a mom today, please Please stand. That's awesome. 
That's awesome. And for you mothers, we also have carnations. When you leave, we do have carnations in the foyer. Please grab one as courtesy and as a gift to y'all. Um, I, I, I can't thank God enough for my mom and for the, the wife that my mom is to my kids. Um, and I thank God he gave me the sense to listen to my mother and to my mom. So uh, it's, it's done me well to obey and listen to her, as the Bible says. And I praise to God that she was a, a believer and she is a believer now. And um, it's, it's been a huge um, influence in my life. <clears throat> uh, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for a beautiful day. We know that you created the family way before the church. Um, 3,000 plus years before the church, you ordained the family and how you gave it a man and a woman, a mommy and a daddy, and how it's so important for that to be the unit because Satan knows very well that the that our future, our past, present, and future generations are forged in the fires of the home and they're hammered out in the day-by-day discipleship and decision-making of the parents, the leadership of the parents. And so Satan is after our moms today um, so viciously and so aggressively. Uh, he, he's after them in, um, in so many aspects. And so for those especially living for you, the moms, the mothers, may you comfort the grieving moms today. May you, uh, may you challenge the, the complacent moms. May you convict the lost moms who may not know you. May you convict them and call them today to your son, through the Holy Spirit. May you draw them to, your, to yourself in the beauty. There's also those moms that aren't moms that want to be moms. For those that uh, maybe cannot give birth or may not have even money to adopt. Um, and we know that you draw close and what a beautiful verse Psalms 113.9 is. You make the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Now you don't promise children to us today. You may not promise children to some of us. But you do promise your close presence. And the thrust of that psalm is all about you stooping down. You coming down to heaven through, Christ, through Jesus Christ. And you meeting our greatest need. And the joy is not found in our families. Our joy is not found in our children. As much as it is, as much as a, a mom is, um, and her, the mandate you've given her. Um, for those who may not have children or cannot have children, may you scoot right next to them today and comfort them and encourage them and show them that um, the greatest blessing and the greatest peace and joy is not our kids, and it truly is your presence and you coming to be with us. Thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for worship today. May you remove all distractions. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen. What do you and mommy do together? Paint. Do you uh, play superheroes? Yeah. Does she give you hugs and kisses? Huh? Yeah. And hold your face. Um, my mom let me wash dishes on the couch. Um, I love that she always like give me hugs and kisses tonight. And she cooks like spaghetti. Oh, that's a great thing. That's so yummy. Do you like spaghetti? Mm -hmm. Oh, you do. <laughs> she cleans my room. She cleans our room, our whole house. She gets me stuff. Her give me an officer sweet car. I love her and I love my dad either. <laughs> either <laughs> one. Hello.
love you, mommy. I 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 love you, mommy. Happy Mother's Day. 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 All right. Now, on, on Sunday mornings, we get together and we get to sing and worship too, don't we? So we're going to sing a couple songs for you guys. You ready? You guys can stand up. All right. All right, here we go. All right, we've got another one, one of our favorites. Are you ready? Here we go. God made me and loves me so and is my friend forever. God made me and loves me so and is my friend forever. And he makes me jump up high and Are tired after service, this is why. 
And if they're not tired, it's not our fault. Okay, now we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me. You guys ready? Jesus loves me. Thank you. You're done. Our ushers can come forward at this time, and you guys can go on back to your class. Thank you so much. Great job. Y'all did so good. Organized chaos. Amen. <laughs> As our ushers come forward, now's the time for our offering, so... Um, thank you so much for being here. And if you, if you have not tithed before and you're wondering how to, what's the next step in your Christian life, you know, how do you get closer to the Lord, how do you grow your faith, to start tithing is a great first step because it does grow your faith. It releases your hand off your money a little bit and you learn to trust God with it. If you've been tithing on and off, the next step is tithing regularly. If you're a regular tither, you're perfect. You don't need to do anything else. You're good. See you in heaven. I'm just kidding. Um, but let's pray over our offering. God, thank you so much for bringing us here this morning. Thank you so much for the blessing that those kids are. I pray for all the moms in here that you would bless them, Lord. Give us a fantastic service. Speak through Jamie later on. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Sing it with me. And I just want God, thank you for a fantastic morning. Now, I pray that you'd speak through Jamie as he brings the word. God, that you open up our hearts to hear what you've got to say. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before you have a seat, greet those around you.
Amen. Amen. First Samuel chapter number one. First Samuel chapter number one is where we're going to be at. I know at most pulpits this morning, most churches today, they're probably going to go to Proverbs 31. Well, let's just be real honest, ladies. That lady gets up early, completes the budget, goes to the market, sews, has breakfast on the table. So I'm not going to put you through the ringer this morning and try to put, uh, uh, compare you to the Proverbs 31 lady. I heard a story about a mom. She had two kids, a little boy, a little girl, who were, uh, she was trying to get dinner on the table, and it was just one of those times. You know moms, wives, husbands coming in from work. She wanted to have dinner on the table, burning something. The, uh, mom, can you help me with my homework? This, the daughter wanted something. The son wanted something. And she gets dinner on the table, and the daughter says, Mom, can you put, get the ketchup out? And she said, yeah, I'll get the ketchup. So she had a little girl the ketchup. She said, Mom, it won't come out. Well, the mom takes the ketchup and starts smacking the bottom of that ketchup. Automatically, the phone rings, of course. And the son gets up from the table, and it's still it's chaos. And he said, Mom, it's the women's director at church. She wants to talk to you. She said, tell her I'm busy right now. And she said, that little boy said, ma'am, my mom can't talk right now. She's hitting the bottle. Hitting the bottle. <laughs> mothers are special, amen? amen? Let me rephrase that. Real mothers are special. Amen. Let me rephrase that again. Ladies in the church are special people. Real mothers would like to be able to eat a whole candy bar all by themselves and drink a Coke without any floaters in it. Real mothers know that their kitchen utensils are probably going to end up in the sandbox. Real mothers often have sticky floors, filthy ovens, and happy kids. Real mothers know that dried Play-Doh does not come out of the carpet. Real mothers do not want to know what the vacuum cleaner just sucked up. Real mothers sometimes ask, why me, and get the answer from a little voice, because I love you best. Real mothers know that a child's growth is not measured by height or years or grade. It is marked by the progression from mama to mom to mother. So real mothers are a class under themselves. Real mothers have an investment in the future because their children are the future. Real mothers are selfless when it comes to their children. They're put, they'll put up with throwing up, spitting up, and the diapers filling up. Amen. And they gladly deal with the crying for hours. They give up their time and their sanity because his child is theirs. They're selfless because they are real mothers. This morning we're going to talk about a real mother. And we could talk about, pull many from Scripture this morning. We could talk about uh, Moses' mother, Jochebed. We could talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. But I really want to talk about Hannah this morning, the mother of Samuel. Because Hannah is a very special woman because she's one of those rare women that God holds up and shows us and we can glean from this morning that we can also see and admire and listen I know it's Mother's Day guys don't tune me out Christians don't tune me out but we can all get something this morning from 1 Samuel chapter number one I'm gonna be looking at verses 10 through 18 so if you have your Bibles would you please stand for the reading of God's word 1 Samuel, chapter number 1, starting in verse 10. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Hannah, that is. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child and I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only in her, her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine 
nor intoxicating drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked him. Verse 18, And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way, ate, and her face was no longer sad. So today we're going to find out what happens, and I'm going to title this one, When Mama Prays. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And Lord, I just, as I sung about just a few moments ago, that we speak Jesus. Lord, I say, I, I pray that today, that they don't see me, they see you. And Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit will reign in this place today. And Lord, I just thank you for all your many blessings. Thank you for mamas, thank you for grandmothers, aunts, sweet ladies in the church. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Now, as we're introduced to Hannah, we find that she's got a problem. What's her problem, you might ask? She cannot have children. Why can't she get pregnant? Because God has closed up her womb. I read a sermon online by a preacher who implied that God really didn't close up her womb. It was just one of those comments that people make when they don't know the cause of a tragedy or a natural disaster. In fact, you'll hear it probably this time of year when maybe a tornado sweeps across a, a part of the country and they call it an act of God. They don't really think God calls a tornado and that preacher online really didn't think God calls Hannah's womb to be closed. But there's a couple of problems with that. Number one, the Bible tells me God closed up her womb. It doesn't say Hannah thought God closed up her womb. It didn't think her husband Elkanah thought that her womb was closed or that the people thought her womb was closed. It said God closed up her womb. And now, excuse me if the Bible tells me God closed her womb, and my first thought is that's probably what happened, that God closed up this lady's womb. The second problem with that act of God approach is that Scripture only uses the phrase closed up a womb one other time. Happened way back in Genesis. If you've been with us on Sunday morning, we're talking, we've been stu uh, studying the, uh, Genesis and uh, doing an Abraham study. And we hadn't gotten this part yet, so I'll, I'll foreshadow. In the days of Abraham and the king of Gerar, Abimelech, had a nasty habit of killing men so that he could gain their wives for his harem. Apparently, Abraham's wife, Sarah, was desirable. And since Abraham had no desire to be killed by the king, he passed Sarah off as his sister. That's twice, if you remember. He does it twice. Didn't learn the first time. But sure enough, Abimelech took her into his harem. But before the king of Gerar could take her, God approached him to, in a dream and explained the situation. He told Abimelech that Sarah was Abraham's wife, that Abraham was his man, his prophet, and if the king ever touched Sarah, he was a dead man. This dream appropriately frightened the king so that he returned Sarah to Abraham and pled for Abraham to pray for him. And we read that Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife, his slave girl, so they could have children again. For the Lord had closed up every womb in Abimelech's household because of Abraham's wife, Sarah. Now in that story, there's no question that God closed up the womb of Abimelech's harem. God was punishing that king, that king of Gerar, for his nasty habit of killing husbands to get to their wives. But here in 1 Samuel, here in the text that we just read a few moments ago, it tells me God closed up Hannah's womb. But was God punishing Hannah? Did God dislike Hannah or something to that effect? No. There's nothing in this story that tells us that she was wicked or evil in any way. In fact, the picture painted here is of a godly woman who is in trouble. Her heart is breaking and she's praying with all her heart that God would help her. That's not the kind of person God punishes. Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. That's Hannah, fully committed to God. God wasn't punishing Hannah. God's eyes had ranged throughout the earth to find a woman just like her. And his eyes focused on her because he knew Hannah would be a woman he could mold into one of the most influential and significant mothers in all of Scripture. Now, this is what happened. Back in the day, Israel was a nation in crisis. Judges 17, 6 tells us, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as 
he saw fit. Everybody did what they felt like doing, and it was not a pretty sight. The whole nation was corrupt. Even Eli the priest and his sons were not that great of people. God needed to bring about a change. He needed to raise up a hero who could lead his people to righteousness. He needed a man who could step up and do what needed to be done. He needed someone who could be a judge, a prophet, and a priest. And in order to train up that kind of leader for Israel, God was going to need the help of a very special kind of mother. And that's where Hannah comes in this morning. Hannah was going to be not only a real mother, but a godly mother. Hannah was the kind of woman that God could count on and work through to train the man he needed to shape his nation of Israel. But first, he had to bring her to the point where she was desperate enough to do what God needed done. Let me pause here. You ever been at that breaking point? You ever been at that point where whatever prayer request it is, whatever is troubling your heart, you're just at your wit's end? Let me just give you some free advice this morning. Quit trying to do it yourself and give it to God. That's what she did. She'd had enough. God knew her heart was breaking, so she decides to go down to the temple and pray because she went meant it. Now, just a little add-on here. When things get rough in your life, and they will, when those curveballs happen, and they will, don't run away from the house of God. Run toward the house of God. But that's a sermon for another day. You know, God sometimes uses our pain to guide us to something he wants us to do. A lot of the song says, if you're at the end of your rope, you cling to the hem of his garment. C.S. Lewis once said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse up a deaf world. In her pain, Hannah come to a decision. If God will give her a son... I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. I'll give him back. What do you mean? Well, they had a little tradition they would do. First son went back to God. Get back to the temple. The priest raised him. The priest would raise the, the, the children. They'd be, they'd be wean off from nursing, and they'd go to the temple. And be raised by the priest. Now can you imagine praying for that son. Praying for that, that boy. We saw it in Abraham. Remember that study? It's coming up. Isaac. Sarah. Couldn't have a child. Couldn't have a child. She laughs because they're such in age of age. They're older. They're golden gems. If you're visiting with us, that's our senior saints. Can you imagine golden gems? God telling you, hey, everyone have a drink. I'm, we're going to have a baby. Amen, brother. You, you thought you saw some wild bucks up in here a little while ago. And praise God for them this morning. Amen? Listen, I, Jack's a future worship leader. Man, that bugger's standing right here, front row. I mean, one of them done went down that way. One of them done stopped, drop, and roll. There was a couple of boogers eat up here. I mean, I don't know. But listen. But listen. That was a good side, amen? And so the firstborn belonged to God anyway, and that's what it was uh, what it said in the law. In Exodus 13, 2, God told his people, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me. So Hannah's firstborn son would have belonged to God from his birth, but like all Israelites, she and her husband would ordinarily have redeemed that child. In Numbers 18, 16, it tells us to Israelites, when your son is a month old, you must redeem him at the redemption price, set at five shekels of silver. But what Hannah is vowing here is this, God, if you give me a son, I'll let you keep him and I won't redeem him back. In her mind, she already decided that if God gave her a son, she'd give him to the priest at the tabernacle to raise and would serve God by helping people to worship. Now, where do you suppose she got that idea? Did she come up with that on her own? Probably not. I'm convinced God put that idea in her heart. And because she came to the point that in her life where she was willing to give her son to God and God rewarded her in some powerful ways, not only does she get pregnant right away, but she bears three more sons and two more daughters. 
1 Samuel 2, 21 tells that the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. But even more significant than that, she was the mother of Samuel. Samuel was one of the greatest men in the Old Testament. He was the last of the judges and first of a long line of prophets. He was such a righteous man that he guided the people out of their immorality back to obedience to God and his law. He was so highly regarded by God that there are not only two books in the Bible that bear his name, but a couple of times God compares his righteousness to that of even Moses. In Jeremiah 15, 1, God condemns the sins of the nation of Judah and declares, even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not go out to these people. Samuel was such a great man that he was equal to Moses in God's eyes. Folks, that's Hannah's boy. That's the boy she gave back to God. Now, she's got three more boys and two more daughters, but I bet you they didn't know their names are. We don't know their names. Samuel gives Hannah bragging rights. She's like the mother who pulls out her wallet and says, this is my son, this is my daughter, this is my son who made it big. And this all happened because Hannah was a godly woman who prayed and prayed. She wanted God's will, not her own. She matched up her will with God's will. Folks, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, anybody, boys and girls, have you done that this morning? Have you matched up your will with God's will? Better yet, have you matched up God's will with your life? Hannah's a godly praying woman. Hannah's the kind of woman that God listens to. We can all be like her, burdened. And we take our burdens to where? We bottle them up. Let's just be honest this morning. We bottle them up, don't we? It's not what the Bible says. Take them to God. He wants our burdens. He is a burden-bearing God. If you want your children to make a, a difference, be, proud, be like Hannah. You want your children to make a difference in this world, be like Hannah. Why? Because Hannah was like God. She patterned her life like God. She was a, she was a, a, a godly woman. So how are we going to do that? How can we be all be like him? Well, folks, if you're a parent, you better be a praying parent, especially in the time we live in right now. A godly mother believes in the power of prayer, and they're willing to pray for their family to the point of weeping before God. Listen, and you can pray for your kids, whether they're this age right here that we're up here, or if they're, you can still pray for your children if they're in their 50s and their 60s. The heart of this entire story centers on Hannah's prayer, and God is so impressed with how she pray, prayed that he tells us in great detail. We're told that she prayed with tears. She prayed with intensity. She prayed with purpose. She prayed that God was going to answer that prayer. And God heard her prayer and gave her the desire of her heart. That's the way we need to learn to pray. And when we do, God tells us in Psalm 37, 4, that if you delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. There's a, I heard a story one time about a Sunday school teacher asking a group of kids, kind of like what we had up here a little, little while ago. And she said, do you pray at certain times? Do you pray before a test? Do you pray before uh, and that one child said, yes. Do you pray before you go to bed? Yes. And she got a little John and she said, little John, do you pray before you eat? Do you say the grace? And he said, no. She said, what do you mean? He goes, I don't pray before I eat. She said, what do you mean you don't pray before you eat? He goes, I don't have to. She said, what do you mean you don't have to? He goes, I don't have to because my mom's a good cook. A godly mother gives her children to God. Some of y'all praying right now for that meal coming up, ain't you? <laughs> Granted, Hannah's gift to God was more dramatic than most of us would think or do, but a godly mother is convinced that God will help her children if she places them in his hands. Folks, when it comes to raising kids, we need God's help. You might think, well, I don't, do we really need God's help? You need the help of the local church house. Some may not believe that, but some pre act like it. You come out on Wednesday night, you just go, go on, go on to class. Go on to class, get down there, get down there. Go on, 
I don't want to see you for an hour and 45 minutes. Some people don't like this comment, but it does take a village. And I think the volunteers we had for these kids love on your kids. They want them to do right, be godly men and women, be future leaders in the church. A godly mother is convinced that, that God will help her children if she places them in his hands. But folks, a Christian should do that anyway. When you and I become Christians, Jesus became the Lord of our lives. And at the point you become his and everything you own should be his. And we give our entire lives to him completely because we're convinced he'll take care of them. That's what Paul meant when he wrote, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That brings us to the third thing a godly woman does. A godly woman wants God's best for her children. She learned the wisdom of Christ's words in the garden, not my will, but thine be done. She does this because she's convinced God's best. Is the best. There's nothing better than she can supply to her children. That's the kind of woman who wonders, will my son be a, a godly man? Will my daughter be in ministry? For here there would be no greater opportunity that would be that they could do in their lives. Now this doesn't mean your kids have to grow up to be in some type of ministry. But folks, if you're a Christian, I firmly believe you already in ministry. Whether you in the mission, listen folks, when you leave here, we've said it before, out there's the mission field. A godly mother keeps her word to God and to others. Listen folks, we can all glean, like I said, something from this this morning. God was able to trust Hannah with this wonderful baby boy because he knew he could trust her to do what, what she promised. As soon as her baby boy was weaned, she marched him right up to the tabernacle and honored her word to God. But she didn't just leave him there. 1 Samuel 2, 19 says, Each year, Hannah made a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Every year, she went to visit her son. And what do you suppose she talked about when she visited him? She told her son about how God had given him to her and how special he was. That brings us to the, another thing. Godly mother tells her children godly stories do our, do our kids see us read the bible do our kids see us pray they see us doing everything else in this world folks they better see us doing the things of god hannah looked for ways and godly women and godly fathers look for ways to tell their children about how god has him or her godly Mothers look for ways to make them understand that God has a purpose for their lives. She looks for ways to drive home that they are precious in his sight. And let me just say this again, folks. We need to thank God as a local assembly for godly mothers, for godly ladies. You know why? We got men. We got building and grounds. That sounds rough, don't it? Building and grounds. See those guys working, they're painting, they're knocking stuff down. They're cutting each other's arms. I don't know what's going on there. But they, it's, it's a manly thing, building and grounds, facilities, such a, such a mechanical word. But folks, the backbone of most churches is the prayer life. And who does that come from? I'll, and I'll hit you guys on Father's Day. It should come from the men. But more times than not, guys, it comes from our ladies. They're the first ones in their prayer closet. They're the first ones on the altar. They're the first ones to stop what they're doing and pray for somebody in this church. And I thank God for it. It was a lady who probably thought of the text line that we have for prayer requests. When you start a prayer chain, Guys, it should be us on the front lines of that prayer chain. More times than not, who starts the prayer chain? Our ladies. Why? Well, folks, it's easy. It's easy math. When you're used to doing something a lot, it's easy to do. So when you're used to praying a lot, it's easy to do and call up or text somebody and say, hey, we need to pray for somebody right now. And who is that? Again, 
It's our ladies. That's why a ladies ministry is so vital to a church. It's crucial to a church. Ladies had a tea party yesterday. Had a marvelous time, I heard. As important as a men's ministry is, just as equal is a ladies ministry. Because that's the, back, that's, the, that's the bone marrow of our praying ministry here at Eastside, is the ladies. You know, a godly mother is one of the most powerful forces on earth. They have within their hands the ability to shape the future with their children. Our daughter Ava, right here, had uh, a surgery done week ago and uh nothing major to me she does not like going to the dentist amen amen so a normal procedure had to be taken out of coney hospital and put under because you know kind of like me i don't like going to this okay so i'm just like ava you know if we just if you just get over yourself hour and a half we could be at the dentist office you just get your little laughing gas and we move on eight hours at the hospital waiting in a small room for her to come out and the recovery and and i'm just <laughs> hungry they brought me a coke and i didn't know if i was on a commercial flight or what and I mean, and then they brought me a Dixie cup to put it in. I didn't know if I was giving them a sample or what. I didn't know what was going on. But of course, my wife, my wife brought me back to reality. Yeah, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about Ava and her, and her, it's her day, you know. And it turned into a weekend because somebody got a brand new bicycle for going through that, and it ain't me, okay? <laughs> but a godly mother is one of the most powerful forces on earth because Chrissy was praying the whole time. I was trying to catch the NBA playoffs on ESPN, the, 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 the playback show. And I did pray for my daughter. Don't think Pastor did. But folks, a godly mother is, again, the most powerful force on this planet. There's nothing they wouldn't do for their children. They have within their hands the ability to shape the future with their children of, of just giving their children back to God. Some of y'all this morning need to give your children to God. Well, they're 54 years old. You know what? Maybe it's time you give them back to God. Maybe your way didn't work and now it's time for God's way. Maybe you're here today and you have a great mother. Today is easy. For others, today can be hard. It can be hard for a, uh, maybe had a, a great mother and she's not here. Maybe you didn't know your mother, but had a great grandmother or an aunt who stepped in and raised you. Maybe you had an awful mother and today you can't find peace. Well, if that's the case, folks, you have a, you have a heavenly father that loves you. Maybe you're not a mother yet or... Maybe being a mother is not a possibility. You're not being punished. God loves you. And listen to me this morning. If today is hard, cling to your heavenly father. He loves you. He'll comfort you. He knows exactly what you need. I tell people all the time, and I've said it before recently, give it to God. That means we actually have to verbalize it. He knows, and give it to him. Maybe you don't know how, didn't know you had a heavenly father. Well, you do now. And he's looking down on you. And he wants a relationship with you. And I get what today brings, and I know Father's Day is coming up in a few weeks too. And you have me thinking, man, I was, maybe I was abused. Maybe I was this and that. 
And, that, and, and that's not fair. I get it. Totally get it. But don't let that rob you of your joy or your victory this morning. You give that to God. And your heavenly Father wants a relationship with you today. Maybe you're like, I don't know how to go by that. In a few seconds, we're going to have an invitation. You come down, and I'll tell you. Maybe you want to become a prayer warrior like Hannah. Won't you start today, hey, I don't pray like I should. Well, during that invitation time, we, we call these steps an altar. You can come and start your prayer life journey today. Maybe you want to give your heart and life to Christ. You've been in churches I want you to do some personal inventory. You don't have to, you don't, don't raise your hand because I don't want to embarrass nobody. When's the last time you were in church? I know it's Mother's Day. Do you treat it like Easter? Do you treat it like Christmas? Do you treat it like a special anniversary? Folks, were you in, were you in church Wednesday night? Were you in church last Sunday morning or Sunday night? And you've heard salvation and you keep hearing it and you don't know what that means or you had that knocking on your heart's door that you need to change. Come down. You're like, I'm not a member of your church. I don't care. Salvation does not require church membership. Or maybe. I got saved a while back and I just hadn't been baptized. Baptism don't save you. Salvation saves. Jesus saves. Baptism we do up there is just an, a display of obedience to show the world that you're a new creation. My salvation does not come whether we pay the water bill or not. Or maybe you've been visiting with us and you want to join our fellowship. Well, we'd love to have you. Get you plugged in. Or maybe maybe there's a burden on your heart like Hannah's had a burden and you've been keeping it. God knows it. You got to, in, in a few short seconds, you're going to have a chance to give that burden to God. You don't have to tell the soul. He already knows it though. Why not give it to him? So folks, I know I titled this one, When Mama Prays. Folks, we all need to be praying. When's the last time you prayed? I'm not talking about God is great, God is good. I'm talking about when's the last time you had a burden for yourself, for your family, for your friends, and just went to your prostate on the ground and asked God to, to, to intervene on somebody's behalf. Please don't sit here this morning and say, I, no, there's nothing I can think of that I can pray for. Pray for me. Pray for your leadership. Pray for your deacons. Pray for your Sunday school teacher. Pray for your family. Folks, there's always something to pray about. Whatever your case is today, you can come on down and you can thank God. How about just thank him for all he's done for you and thank him for what he'll continue to do for you see what happens not just when mama prays but when christians pray would you please stand and bow your head and close your eyes nobody looking around maybe mother's day's tough i get it maybe you've lost a child God knows. You can come give that burden to God. Maybe, maybe mama's not here.
you can honor her today. By giving your life to Christ. Whatever it is. Why not come right now? I'm not talking about an act of emotion. I'm talking about an act of obedience. Why not come right now as the Holy Spirit leads? You may not know a soul, but four people on your pew. Don't let the devil get in your brain today. Don't let him distract you from what God wants you to do today. You come right now as the Holy Spirit leads.